Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to Daksha series, our endeavor to throw light on topics of contemporary interest in a focused and thematic manner. In this inaugural edition, we focus on the theme of data risks and rights, a matter of great interest to lawyers and policymakers. Many of you gathered here today would have attended the last four days of Daksha series titled Data Risks and Rights, and you would have uh, seen a vibrant round of conversations around surveillance, around uh, uh, the use of data for public policy and governance and the various harms, and of course, privacy, and certainly the concepts and principles relating to data protection. Uh, I am Anand Padmanabhan, Dean at Daksha Fellowship, India's first fellowship for lawyers with specialization in three different pathways, technology, law and policy, law and regulation, and disputes resolution. And we are grateful to Loctopus for partnering with us and promoting the cause of legal education. Today, in this final uh, edition uh, event as part of the uh, Daksha series on data rights, risks and rights, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Neha Chaudhary. Uh, Neha heads the policy practice at Ikigai Law, a technology and innovation focused law and policy firm. She advises some of the world's largest technology companies, startups, trade associations, and think tanks on data governance law, regulation and policy, among other areas. She has read law at the Harvard Law School and the Nalsa University of Law. Today, Neha is going to address us on practical aspects of data protection, including issues surrounding compliance on the part of data fiduciaries, such as technology companies and social media giants, the enforcement machinery, including the proposed data protection authority, the penalties for non-compliance with various obligations under the personal data protection bill, and controversial subtopics such as data localization. This masterclass builds on the class taken yesterday by Malavika Raghavan, where she spoke about the rationale for data protection and its interaction with the right to informational privacy, basic principles that guide data protection, elemental concepts such as personal data and sensitive personal data, the rights conferred upon data principles and exceptions to the same. For those of who, you who missed yesterday's masterclass, I would request you all to check out Daksha Fellowship's channel on YouTube where the masterclass video has been uploaded. Finally, before we begin this session, I would like to remind everyone that we are all participants in this session are on view, uh, but you can post your questions and queries in the Q&A tab and we will take them up both during and at the end of the session. And on that note, over to you Neha for this masterclass. Thank you for being here with me. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Anand. It's an absolute uh, pleasure to be here. Congratulations to you and the whole team uh, on everything that you've been putting together on the Daksha Fellowship so far. And on behalf of the whole team at Ikigai, our very, very warm and best wishes. I'm personally really excited to see where this goes. Very excited to see um, to see how this would shape up. And I think that this has a this has a lot of uh, promise to transform the way we think about um, legal legal education um, in this country. I'm of course personally very excited about the about the tech track and really excited to see to see how this shapes up. Okay. So um, hi everyone. A very very good evening to all of you. Thanks so much for making time on a Friday evening to come and listen to us uh, uh, talk about uh, data data protection. Um, I will be doing presentation in two parts, Anand, if that uh, if that works for you. Uh, in the first half of the session, we'll go through what the regulatory architecture is. We'll take a little break. We can uh, we can take up questions during that time. And in the second part of the presentation, we can move on to the more practical aspects, compliance, enforcement, and penalties. And data localization will also be a part of this section. If that works for you, I'll just uh, quickly share my screen. Sure. And we can just do a presentation. Just give me one second while I sort that out. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Is that working? Yeah, that's good. All right, excellent. Okay, great. All right, here we are. So we'll look at uh, in part one, while we're thinking about regulatory structure, we look at the key players um, in the regulatory architecture. We look at what the powers and tasks of um, sort of sort of each player are. Broadly, when we look at the personal data protection bill, 
there uh, there are two broad components i would say of the kind of regulators that we have or the kind of actors to put it more appropriately who have a role to play in the regulatory architecture some of them are of course external you have a brand new regulator which will be set up the data protection authority of india the central government will continue to play a key and pivotal role and on the dispute side we will see a new tribunal the appellate tribunal which will be set up these are your external actors then there are some actors that the bill introduces which are also internal actors by internal i mean internal to the organization in some ways or who have a role to play that is more inward facing within the organization there are three of these broadly you have your data auditors you have your adjudicating officers and you have data protection officers now um you you'll also notice as i go through a lot of these slides that they're fairly detailed don't worry i'm not going to be going through all of this content in excruciating detail we'll just discuss um the broad principles and key themes that emerge and um, anand please feel free to share these slides later with uh, with the attendees sure whoever might want to have a more detailed look sure. okay so like we said like we were saying you have the data protection authority which is going to be a new regulator that will be set up and the central government and the appellate tribunal in the appointments of both the data protection authority as well as the appellate tribunal the central government continues to play a key and pivotal role uh, the central government will establish both of these authorities you will notice that both of them talk about the involvement of um, certain experts that um, in the fields of data protection or information technology or the law you will notice that the appellate tribunal has to be chaired by a former judge either a supreme court judge or a former chief justice of a high court in the central government the meti which is our ministry of electronics and uh, information technology will of course be the ministry in charge interestingly the data protection bill does not rule out the role to be played by different sectoral leaders even in all of the conversations that have led up to the um, framing of the bill in the current shape that we have sectoral leaders have continued to play uh, an important uh, role even in these conversations and they featured fairly prominently um some of you might be aware of the reserve bank of india having instituted a data localization mandate uh, the the telecom ministry telecom uh, operators in india are required to store some data locally in india so different sectoral regulators do have a role to play and the pdp bill has a mechanism in place for how the powers and functions of the dpa and the different sectoral regulators need to be reconciled with each other now when we talk about uh, moving very briefly to the other players that we have you have data auditors which will be an independent category it's a new kind of professional that the dpa and uh, that the that the person data protection will envisage they will be appointed by the dpa adjudicating officers are appointed by the central government but they are a part of the dpa and of course you have data protection officers which are to be appointed by the companies themselves now interestingly there has been a new development as of i want to say last week or maybe earlier this week in europe where there was one case that speaks to um maybe the neutrality or the position that a data protection officer occupies within an organization and their independence which is now in privacy circles led to a larger debate on whether a data protection officer can be an employee of the organization uh, or whether it has to be somebody external or independent uh, that that the organization needs to employ now in big picture draw very very simply put the dpa will be the authority that is tasked with implementing the person data protection law whenever it comes into effect and with enforcing it this is the body that will make sure that organizations in the in the country are complying with the various provisions of the new data protection bill will hear complaints will conduct inquiries will take action when there is a data breach so on and so forth the role of the central government is on a much more macro level all policy level decisions big picture policy level decisions are the purview of the central government the central government also makes financial grants to the dpa 
it um, notifies certain provisions into effect it gives effect you a lot of the detailed implementation of the person data protection bill will happen through subordinate legislation and the central government is tasked with making um, rules and uh, rules that give effect to a lot of the provisions of the person data protection bill the most critical role though will be on these policy level decisions for example um, there are different categories of data as you may have heard from uh, malavika's conversation yesterday one of them is critical personal data and criti critical data can be stored and processed fully in india and it will be up to the central government to notify categories of data that that are critical data similarly uh, there are certain conditions under which person data can be taken out of the country or can be transferred overseas and it's up to the central government to decide who these countries are or who these organizations or institutions are to whom you can transfer your data outside the appellate tribunal as the name implies is going to be at the uh, dispute resolution side of things if you are unhappy with any decision taken by the dpa or the adjudicating officer we appeal to the appellate tribunal now data auditors again as the name implies is somebody who will audit the performance of a particular company if i am a data auditor it's my job to make sure that um, it's my job to audit your performance essentially like you have auditors in the financial sector as well we are going to see potentially a new category of professionals called data auditors now data auditors i'll come to this nuance um, in the in the later half of the presentation data auditors and data protection officers as well uh, are applicable only to a certain category of companies called significant data fiduciaries and we'll talk about that in the second half of the presentation now um where and to what extent do different bodies have the freedom to decide their own functioning or what do you do about your day to day functioning broadly again you will see the theme of the big picture decisions still rests with the central government the actual incorporation and establishment of the dpa as well as the appellate tribunal is something that the central government will do giving the appellate tribunal staff to perform its everyday functions is something that the central government will do giving grants is something that the central government will do the dpa is required to submit um, accounts is required to maintain records it's required to file an annual report and required to submit all of this to the central government the annual report and an annual account um, statement will also be tabled before the parliament the dpa has a lot more freedom i would say when it comes to deciding its day to day functioning to a limited extent again the bigger picture decisions of where my if i need to open a branch office at a dp as a dpa is something that the central government will decide in terms of um the powers and functions that the officials of a dpa have when i am discharging my duties during the course of my duties i will be treated as any other civil servant would for the purposes of the indian penal code this basically means that i won't be prosecuted for any action that i have taken in good faith in ex in ex in while i am while i am discharging my duties as a part of the as a part of the dpa now what are some of the larger questions of sort of rule and decision making again here you will notice when it comes to the dpa and the central government the central government has a fair fairly strong role to play when it comes to its interactions with the dpa which has also led to some criticism of the independence of the dpa in policy circles uh, the dpa is meant to be an independent regulator and is meant to function like an independent regulator a lot of people have raised some concerns about the fact that well if the central government is going to do things like frame rules it's going to issue directions to the dpa that are binding on the dpa how can you call this regulator to be an independent regulator why is this important because the central government is in itself subject to the personal data protection bill unless of course it chooses to exempt itself from the application of certain sections of the law which also it has the power to so that's 
that's a recurring theme that you will find when it comes to the decision making that a DPA can do. What are the kinds of things that the DPA can do typically will revolve in the field of day to day implementation and enforcement. I as the DPA can issue codes of practice which are non binding, but will act as guidance documents for different companies as they think through complex issues of uh, implementing personal data protection bill. What does notice mean? What should a notice look like? How do I get somebody's explicit consent? What does privacy by design mean? Do I need to have certain, is there a standard, uh, is there a way of encrypting information that I should be aware of? Things like that, sort of day-to-day -day functionality that will help you comply with uh, the person data protection law will be a code of practice. The DPA is the authority that takes decisions on whether or not um, any organization, whether it's a data fiduciary or a controller or a data processor has complied with the person data protection law. They are the people that listen to complaints from individuals. They are the people that take action whenever there is a person data protection breach. Um, when it comes to an appellate tribunal, an appellate tribunal, interestingly, is not bound by the CPC. The law only says that you need to follow principles of natural justice, but you're free to figure out whatever your procedure is. But when it comes to trying a suit, you do have the powers of a civil court under the CPC. Similarly, when it comes to executing your decree, you have the same powers as a civil court under the CPC. Appeals from the appellate tribunal will lie directly to the Supreme Court. Now, DPOs, data auditors, DPOs is something we'll come to again in the second half of the presentation. Now, very quickly on checks and balances, and I will stop after this and we can take some questions. The law envisages uh, the DPA to be uh, an independent regulator, but like we've said, there is a fair bit of central government involvement in policy decisions around personal data protection bill. What are the other different checks and balances that the law sort of envisages? One is whenever you have sector, it doesn't rule out the role or the important role that sectoral regulators will continue to play. In fact, there's, uh, there's very clear language in the bill that talks about if there were to be a overlap of jurisdiction between the DPA and any other parliamentary uh, or statutory authority actually, the DPA and these other authorities must talk to each other to decide what the course of action will be. And you can even sign an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, to finalize what the course of action is going to be. Then there are certain other situations in which the law says that the DPA must act after consulting other state, other sectoral regulators. It must act undertaking a stakeholder consultation. The feedback here from, uh, from very many stakeholders has been that this is great, but maybe you want to mandate stakeholder consultations and um, especially industry participation when it comes to the, on, on the implementation side of things and designing codes of practice, so on and so forth. Uh, then, um, of course, you have your, your, your sort of standard set of safeguards in place. Your accounts have to be audited by the, com the Comptroller and Auditor General of India. Like I was saying earlier, your annual report and your financial annual sort of financial statement also has to be tabled before the Parliament. Interestingly, when it comes to the central government, um, and this may be a little bit of my bias speaking here as well, you don't find necessarily the same level of safeguards or checks and balances. And you have to rely on your existing sort of statutory limitations or your existing jurisprudence on what the, uh, on, 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 on the powers and lim on, on, on limitations of lawmaking power by, by the executive. A class example that has come under a fair bit of criticism is the government's power to suspend the application of any sort of provision of the law from any of its agencies at any given point of time. So there is a fairly widely worded provision, it's section 35, under the Person Data Protection Bill, based on which the government can sort of exercise this power. There is another one which deals with non-personal data, where the government can ask 
organizations to share non-personal data with it for uh, policy making or for empirical sort of evidence-based policy making essentially. Now, both of these powers have been criticized by large sections of civil society, by large sections of the industry as well, as being overbroad and far-reaching and without their limits. So if, if you are looking, if you're looking at privacy jurisprudence, then we'll have to turn to Putiswami to talk about the three-part test and what the limitations on the government's powers should be. But my, my personal reading of the bill is that the central government continues to play a very, very important role in shaping data governance, law and policy in this country. And there is a fair bit of sort of a, a, a wide ranging powers that it exercises. And I think, honestly, my personal view is that it could do with, uh, with more checks and balances in the law itself. As for the appellate tribunal, uh, appeals lie to the Supreme Court. And um, for the functioning of the other officers that we talked about, the DPA will be making, ro will be making rules that will decide the role and will spell out their functioning in more detail. So we'll have to wait for uh, the delegated legislation before we can comment on that. I will stop here, Anant, to see if we have some questions. Yes, uh, we, we have quite a few. So I'll uh, take one, I take it uh, thematically. So Akhil Bharadwaj has asked a question. Uh, would you be able to provide some form of a comparison between the powers of the DPA vis-a-vis -vis the central government in comparison with other sectoral regulators, such as perhaps the NCLP or the TRI? And there is a connected question which uh, has been asked by an anonymous attendee. Recently, there was a judgment from the Madras High Court in relation to the constitution of the GST tribunal and the requirement for judicial members and lesser interference from the central government with respect to members in the tribunal. Will a similar decision slash amendment be impactful for controlling the relationship between the central government and the authority for data protection? Okay, I'll take the I'll take the second question, uh, um, Anant, and then we'll move on. We'll move on to the first one. Sure. Mm -hmm. On, I'm not aware of that decision, but honestly, it, it sounds extremely interesting to me. And also interesting because there has been a fair bit of criticism that uh, from, from our privacy sort of policy circles as well on the composition of the DPA. Lots and lots of people have said that maybe we need to have an independent member there. You need to have somebody that has, that has a far more sort of judicial experience, so on and so forth. So the similar line of uh, the line of thinking or argumentation that this judgment seems to point to is also something that we've seen emerge out of the criticism for uh, the composition of the DPA itself. Would I personally like to see a far more independent DPA? Yes, 100%. Do I think that an independent member would be the way to achieve that? Well, yes, but also note that um, this independent member is going to be one amongst very many who are a part of the DPA. So, if you're going to be an independent member only in name, then that doesn't really, that, that only gets you so far. Do I think having independent voices is important? Yes, of course. But do I also think that there need, that need to be other mechanisms for uh, where we figure out what exactly the role of the central government is going to be? I think we need to have a larger sort of deeper uh, conversation on that, which then also leads, which also then is a segue into, I think, question number one. On, on on how these sort of um, on how these regulators sort of stack stack up against each other I think it's tricky here with the person data protection bill or with the PDP bill honestly one because it's a newer area that we're all trying to grapple our um, our heads around and the risk of harm to an individual I honestly think is far greater than when it comes to your uh, than when it comes to telecom or when it comes to uh, you know sort of company law and I'm and I'm pretty sure Malvika must have spoken about about harm and the risk of harm sort of uh, there yesterday I think the concern with having central government involvement in policy in adjudication is that there could potentially be a little bit of a conflict of interest here because I, as the central government, I am a huge data fiduciary. I constantly, I have access to immense amounts of citizens' data 
I have, uh, you know, through, through a lot of the programs that we have instituted in this country, as well as we are continuing to sort of institute in this country. Then if I have the decision to make, uh, to appoint the tribunal or the authority that is in charge of holding me to task, then, you know, we, we have a little bit um, of a problem. In terms of how their powers are distributed or the role that the central government plays in appointments, in terms of auditing of accounts, so on and so forth, I honestly think that's fairly standard. The TRI, interestingly, has a clause um, where it's a lot more transparent about its decision making and we don't see very many other regulators do that, honestly. You, we'll be we'll be hard pressed to find some good examples. So to that extent, the inclusion of similar language in the Person Data Protection Bill, I think, is great. Where you're talking about the DPA needing to talk to different regulators, talk to different stakeholders, and take their inputs. I think if other stakeholders had their way, we'd have this sort of hard coded into law, and say that you must take stakeholder inputs. Personally, what I would love to see is regulators coming to us with the problems that they're trying to solve and exploring different ways to solve them, potentially, as opposed to a more heavy handed regulation where you say, um, you know, uh, data localization, and this is something that we can talk about, right, is that we're worried about the security of data in this country, we're worried about law enforcement access, and our solution to that is data localization full stop which is not, which as opposed to saying, hey, these are the two problems that we're facing, can we now figure out a way to deal with it? Thanks, Neha. So there's a question from Divid Jain. Uh, the impact of the data protection law is significant on smaller enterprises dealing with personal and sensitive data. Therefore, how do you balance the economic cost of implementing the law and allowing for the digital economy to flourish? Furthermore, what changes can be suggested in the law to reduce the burden on these smaller enterprises? Uh, should we take that up in the second half? Yeah, Anna? sure. We can, yeah. we can take that up in the second half. I think I'll flag it. And, uh, uh, there is also a broader question uh, that Chetan Kumar has raised. Whether the law of personal data protection extends adequate protection to IPR? IP, IPR is out of the scope of the person data protection bill. Protection, yes. The IP, yeah, the IPR issue is interesting because it pops up in the context of non-personal data. Now, um, there is a section 91 of the person data protection bill, like we were saying, says that um, the central government can basically ask you to share non-personal data uh, with it for, you know, some two or three different reasons. And non-personal data is all information that is not personal data. So, which typically might refer to aggregated data, anonymized data. And um, businesses are concerned uh, because this could potentially have implications for intellectually intellectually protected ip protected information right so if i have uh, certain information that is confidential to my business which is non personal data does that mean that i now have to share this with the central government that could that is an area of concern has the bill um, adequately thought about it well there's there's no language there's no exception for for any of these things there is a new committee that uh, the government had constituted uh, under the chairmanship of Chris Kopalakrishnan that's looking at some of these uh, issues and we'll have to wait and see what that report tells us about non-personal data sharing. There's an interesting question. Some of it overlaps with what was uh, discussed yesterday, but I would uh, read it out uh, by Samir Guveri. In the case of portability of data, the company transfers customer data. Is the company authorized to retain a copy of the data? We'll discuss this in the second uh, in the second half. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I think then a lot of other questions too are on the second segment on localization, etc. So I think we can continue this uh, conversation and then you know we can club it all, take it. Later. Okay, cool, awesome. So let's move into compliance and enforcement, and and of course penalties and everything that goes with it. Now uh, compliance obligations under the bill. What we need to remember is that there are two big actors when it comes to uh, the person data protection bill. You have your data fiduciaries, basically uh, also called data controllers around the world, and you have your data processors. Data fiduciaries are the people who are making decisions about the information. What happens to this person information, how it needs to be processed, what's going to be used for, things like that. 
and data processors are the people who are merely processing the data who are acting on the instructions and advice of the data fiduciary if you start making decisions about what is to happen with the data you become a data fiduciary the bill also envisages a certain category of data fiduciaries to be significant data fiduciaries this means though you're so large or your processing is so sensitive or your turnover is so massive or you're dealing with the data of so very many people that um, the risk of harm to the individual could potentially be higher therefore uh, we will carve out a separate category of entities whose activities are more significant and we'll call them significant data fiduciaries now these entities face have to do everything that a data fiduciary does and have certain heightened obligations as well now what is it that a data fiduciary must do you must do everything that's on this slide you must adhere to all sort of data processing principles you can process data on the basis of, you must make sure that you've given enough notice that you're taking the right kind of consent that you're purposing that you're processing data only for a limited very clearly sort of defined uh, for a clearly defined purpose you're not storing it for as long uh, for longer than you need you're only collecting as much as you need you know so on and so forth you have to make sure that you are giving data principles which is individuals you and i the ability to exercise all of their rights meaningfully so i must be able to interact with you to be able to exercise my my right to access my right to be able to port data my right to correction so on and so forth you must implement a privacy by design policy but privacy by design also extends to beyond just having a privacy by design policy in place for an organization it involves thinking it, it involves changing the way you think about interacting with the data right from the point at which you're thinking about your business what kind of information do i need to collect how much information do i need to collect what is the best way in which i can get effective clear consent from my users now a lot of these decisions are extremely complex that involve very many teams of an organization putting their heads together and arriving at a decision and some of these questions also sort of go to very first principles and to the core of a company's model if i am um you know if i am a fintech platform for example what are the what are the data or if i'm a if i'm a fintech platform that's providing like loan services uh, lending services to my customers what are the data points that i need to collect from my customer to be able to assess whether or not they're credit worthy on the basis of which i then decide to extend a loan to them or not that could be one use case am i really what is the level of information uh that i need to collect maybe say as a social media company do i or do i need to collect location data constantly and these are first principle questions that people in organizations have to ask themselves as they make decisions about what their product will look like as they make decisions about what their business processes etc etc are going to look like so privacy by design extends to you know it's it's the very dna of your organization in a manner of speaking you'll need your tech teams involved you'll need your product teams involved your business teams involved your legal teams involved strategy teams involved and you'll have to start um you know you'll you'll have to start at the beginning when you ask yourself for every sort of data point that you're collecting is this really necessary what do i intend to do with this that's a privacy by design approach to thinking um in addition to privacy by design of course you're going to have to implement um all necessary all necessary safeguards uh, to make sure that your data is safe and secure to make sure that data is not getting breached you'll have to make sure that there is enough transparency in the way in which you're dealing with person data you're making that information available to users easily and access in addition of course you must uh, periodically notify data principles about the important operations that that you are that you are undertaking with the with person data uh now what happens when there is a data breach is something that we'll talk about in just a minute 
the additional obligations when it comes to significant data fiduciaries. Significant data fiduciaries, like we said, are, uh, you know, are data fiduciaries plus, 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 based on a range of criteria that the person data protection bill has prescribed for us. Now, there are three additional things that I need to do, three or maybe four additional things that I need to do as a significant data fiduciary. One, my policies and practices will be annually audited by an independent data auditor. Independent data auditors, like we said, are a new category of entities or professionals that the person data protection bill envisages who will be empaneled with the DPA. So the DPA needs to recognize you as a data auditor before you can, uh, before you can well go around auditing data practices. The second thing that you need to do is you need to conduct a data protection impact assessment when the DPA requires you to do so. The DPA may, when will the DPA require this? If you're undertaking any kind of processing activity, again, that the DPA feels could potentially harm certain people, harm certain categories of people, uh, things like that, we'll say first you conduct a data protection impact assessment, you file that report with me, and then we'll decide whether or not you can go ahead and actually do what it is that you want to do. What else does the DPA says? It says that you must employ you must appoint not employ you must appoint a data protection officer who is going to well make sure that you're complying with the person data protection bill this officer can give you advice it can give you information monitor your activities and then file a report with the data protection authority as well the dpa may also um, you know, the DPA is going to keep track of who the significant data fiduciaries are and based on their policies and practices also assign a data trust score, not unlike your energy efficiency ratings that you see on multiple appliances or the ratings that we give ourselves, uh, that we both give and get in a gig economy. That's something that, uh, that we're likely to see rolled out for significant data fiduciaries as well. But the bill is, uh, is, is silent on, on, on how exactly this is going to work. Data processors have their lives slightly easier. There are two things that you need to do broadly as a data processor. You, the law recognizes that you're not really the one who is making decisions about the information or having control over what happens with that information. So it tells you to do two things. One, make sure that you're following the instructions of the data fiduciary. You must process data only as per the instructions of the data fiduciary, which will, of course, be captured in whatever contractual arrangement is there between the two parties. And secondly, is the obligation to make sure that data is safe and secure. I need to implement all possible security safeguards, like you can see on the screen in front of you to make sure that the data is safe and secure. If I fail to do any of these two things, then I, as a data processor, am potentially liable under the person data protection bill. Now, data localization, right? Now, uh, amongst the range of very many different obligations that a data fiduciary is subject to, is your data localization requirement. Say it means restriction on taking data out of a country either entirely or, or in part. Now, this could play out in very many different ways like you can see in on the screen in front of you. You could either say all data must be stored and processed only in India or you could have restrictions on a certain component of that data. In the person data protection bill, we deal with three categories of data differently. One is your larger sort of universal set of personal data. The law doesn't really place restrictions on transferring personal data simpliciter outside the country. You can take it, you're free to take it uh, wherever you want to take it. No questions asked. When it comes to sensitive personal data, the screws tighten a little bit. And when it comes to critical personal data, they, they tighten the most. Sensitive personal data, the law says, well, you can transfer it overseas, but you must continue to store it in India. Now, this language has been uh, the subject of a little bit of debate again in privacy and policy circles. Does this mean that I take the data overseas, finish processing activity with it, but must when, it, when the data is at rest, it must come back to India? Or does it mean that a copy of that sensitive person data must be in India at all times, and I am free to take another copy overseas. 
the law isn't entirely clear on which of these two interpretations is correct. So the community is sort of uh, divided on whether it's the former or whether it's the latter. So that's the restriction on sensitive personal data. And even with this, there are certain conditions under which sensitive personal data can be transferred overseas. One, you need to take explicit consent. Two, you can transfer it only to a pre-approved entity or organization or country. Now, again, here you see the central government playing a key role in a policy decision, which is notifying who these permitted countries, organizations or institutions are. In on the other hand, if you don't want to go down this route, you can do consent plus a DPA approved contract or intra-group scheme. Now, um, and of course, the DPA should have allowed this person data to this sensitive person data to leave the country in the first place. When it comes to critical personal data, note that we don't know what critical data is. The law tells us that the, the government, the central government at a later date will decide what critical personal data is and will let us. This data can be stored and processed only in India as rule of thumb. You can transfer it overseas in limited circumstances where either, the, again, the central government has allowed you to do so or if it's a, a health emergency or if it's any other kind of emergency that needs prompt action, then you can take it overseas, but you have to tell the DPA that this is what we did with critical data. Now, the, the, the broader debates on data localization have, it's been one of the more polarizing issues that we've seen in the person data protection debate in this country. The arguments in favor of data localization have been broadly two, maybe three. The primary amongst these is the fact that, um, is, is law enforcement access to data? Is that the, the current system that we have for getting data, access to data stored overseas is extremely complicated. It, it, it requires going through a slow, bureaucratic, complex, diplomatic channels, which just doesn't work for us as the Indian government. Um, the beef is primarily with, uh, with the United States because a lot of the data that is currently stored is, um, you know, is with the larger sort of American tech companies that store the data overseas. So the argument of the Indian government is that, well, the current system is just not working and we need to be able to find a new way to, uh, to store data maybe, to be able to get around these challenges. That's been the law enforcement sort of angle to it. The other angle, which has been the economic angle, is that, um, or, the, or the more nationalistic angle, is that, well, the data of Indians belongs to Indians. Indians should be able to get um, economic benefit out of their data. Our data should not be used or exploited uh, by companies coming here, taking our data, making money off of it and taking, taking it overseas. And it should be, we should get some benefits out of that data. It should be our companies having easier access to this data. For all of these reasons, it must be stored in India. The other angle on the economic side has also been that, uh, well, it will lead to the development of, uh, or it will help the development of India's domestic industry, maybe the IT industry, data centers, for sure, will spring up. So there's lots of economic benefits tied to data localization. Therefore, we must store it in the country. Now, critics have said, well, this just doesn't work. What you're trying to do is create a splinter net, like split the internet. Cross-border data flows are fundamental to how uh, large multinational org organizations or even the smaller ones that do business over the internet or across borders are structured. And you need uh, the free flow of information for such businesses to thrive. More than the larger companies, the smaller businesses are at risk, is uh, uh, people argue, because I will not be able to afford complying with a data localization mandate of a particular country or I may simply not want to. So does that mean that I stop offering services in that particular country? What's going to happen to me? 
Civil society has also uh, flagged off a surveillance risk, which is that, well, until um, India gets its act together and we reform our surveillance laws, it's extremely easy for the government to have access to our personal information in this country. The risk of surveillance or government access to information is only exacerbated with the, uh, if the quantity of data that's stored in this country increases. So until we get our act together on the surveillance reform side, we're not going to have a conversation around data localization. Um, what hasn't been really discussed uh, in detail in India is potential, uh, is potential environmental harms, if there could be any, is uh, whether something like this is permitted under international trade law. There's some scholarship out there that seems to suggest that there isn't, that this may not be allowed under an international uh, trade framework, but not, not, not necessarily a lot of it. The other angle uh, that we've uh, that we've seen come up when it comes to data localization is the impact that it will have on Indian startups. Some have said that uh, you know this is this is it, it'll be good for the it'll be good for Indian startups because data stored in the country will mean easier access to data for startups. On the other hand, some have said well startups rely on the free flow of information. A lot of our clients, in fact, tell us that there are two factors that primarily go into deciding where I store my data. One of them is latency, which is that I want to keep my data as close to my customer base as possible. So if I'm a video streaming platform, um, I want to keep that buffer, uh, I want to keep that information uh, in servers as close to the country which this information in which my services will people will be streaming or accessing my services because nobody likes to see that that sort of buffer uh, that, that sort of, you know that wheel that pops up on our screen when we, when we're waiting for a video to buffer um, for startups it's also often a decision of um, pricing of course I will store my information in servers where it's cheapest for me to for me to do so I will go to a cloud service platform but if I'm getting a better deal on their Singapore server than I'm getting on their India server then I might you know choose to have my information in their Singapore server for a lot of companies it also comes down to the kind of services that are on offer by these cloud service platforms now not especially when it comes to something uh, something that could be more recent or, or still developing, like, you know, playing around with machine learning services or so on and so forth, or some kind of new data analytics service. Uh, a company or cloud service platform may not necessarily pull this out at the same time across the board um, in all of their data centers, because there's a whole range of factors that go into deciding when and at what point I choose to launch certain offerings in certain countries. So, I, as a company, I, as a customer of this cloud platform, I want to be able to make my decision based on the services that are being offered in different, uh, in, in different countries and data, uh, uh, data centers uh, or regions around the world. Now, very quickly, what is this? And we've had some of this conversation already. So what does this look like for companies in practice? Some first principle questions that we all need to ask ourselves, right? Does this data protection law even apply to me? Am I doing business in India? Am I doing business with an Indian entity such that I get affected? If the answer to that is yes, then the next question to ask is, am I a controller? Am I a processor? It's possible to be both. It's possible for some things where you're a data controller in some other uh, for some other actions, you're wearing the hat of a data processor. Now, this distinction and figuring out having this clarity is extremely critical because this is what will decide what level of compliances we are subject to under uh, the person data protection law. The other question that companies often have to grapple with is what happens if, you know, you have so many data protection laws now around the world. What happens if the standards are different? And they are. Some countries have more restrictions on the cross-border transfer of data, some of them have lesser. Com uh, co countries deal with processing children's data, for example, extremely, diff uh, extremely differently. So you'll see companies try and arrive at some kind of a... Uh, you know, uh, try and achieve some kind of consensus across a range of da different data protection practices. So you try and standardize to the best extent possible. Some of them 
uh, and then and then you sort of differentiate just for the latter. Some of them may some of them may think that well this is too complicated and hard for us to do. So we're just going to go with the maximum possible standard, whether it's India, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's Singapore, whatever that be, and comply with that and sort of roll that out across the board. We saw a lot of companies doing this after the GDPR had come into effect. For example, even if you were an Indian customer, you had access to certain um, pro certain products and features that were enabled after the GDPR had already come in had already come into effect. So when organizations begin compliance, they typically, one of the first things that they need to do is to take stock of what kind of information is with them. What categories of information do you have? How much of it is personal? How much of it is sensitive? How much of it is critical? And then make a life cycle or a map of all of these data points from the time of collection to the time of deletion and then decide, then you will be able to, once you have that map in front of you is when companies will be able to figure out what are the kind of obligations that need to apply, what section of data or what data sets need to be subject to what obligation. Like we've seen critical has a, you know, has certain heightened restrictions on cross-border transfers, so on and so forth. So uh, privacy by design again is something that we've talked about in fair detail. Now, what happens in case there is a breach of data, right? This is where it gets interesting. And again, this has been an issue that has divided the privacy or the policy community in India. Under the current PDP bill, the company must inform the data protection authority when there is a data breach, where such breach is likely to harm the data principle. So if I as the company think that there has been a data breach, this breach will now harm, uh, will now harm say Anand. I must go and tell the DP there's been a breach and I think Anand will be harmed and give the DPA the certain information, what kind of data, how many people are affected, what I'm going to do about it, so on and so forth. Then the DPA will decide whether or not I as the company must inform Anand that there has been a breach of data. Now, some organizations have uh, critiqued this to say, well, this is why should the DPA decide when the individual gets told about a data breach, the individual must be told about her data being breached in all circumstances. And it's not up to the DPA to make that call. Some other people have said, well, data breaches could also be fairly unique, uh, could also be fairly routine, uh, could have been taken care of extremely quickly. So what is the need to really alert the individual in all circumstances? Imagine if you were the individual, would you like to be pinged constantly if there was a data breach, so on and so forth. So uh, this is a judgment call that has to be made and the current system, the current sort of uh, the way the law envisages it is perfectly okay. Now, what are the remedies that an individual has? Again, in the law, this is a two-tiered mechanism. One is, first, the law says the companies need to be dealing with this at their level. You need to have a grievance officer. In the case of a significant data fiduciary, this will be your data protection officer who must listen to individual complaints and resolve them fairly quickly in 30 days quickly. Um, if the individual is not happy with the resolution, or if the individual wants to appeal this, then you can well go and uh, file a complaint with the data protection authority. DPA does very many things. It issues guidances, it issues codes of practice, it issues directions. When it receives a complaint, typically an inquiry officer of the DPA will inquire into uh, any, any activity of a company or a, a data fiduciary or a data processor. Now this inquiry officer needs permission from a court before it can actually um, conduct any kind of search or seizure. If I file a complaint as an individual, then an adjudicating officer of, of the DPA will examine my case and will then decide whether or not a penalty or compensation is, is due to me. Penalties are, of course, varied. It depends on the kind of offense that there is uh, or the kind of offense that the committee has, that, that the company has uh, has committed or what is the what is the harm that the individual has suffered. Like the GDPR, they're, um, they're, they're fairly high and they can range up to 4% of my total worldwide, of my total sort of worldwide turnover. Appeals, again, the appellate system is something that we've talked about as well. 
criminal penalties which the person data protection bill envisages have also been criticized um the criticism has been well that well these are civil wrongs and you have enough of a redressal mechanism through the compensation and the penalty too why do you have criminal penalties in place as well that's one second is that the provisions in terms of who is on the hook are also fairly wide right if you look at the language there that's almost identical to uh, to what's in to what's in the bill every person who was in charge or responsible to the company at the time is on the hook unless of course you can show that i did not uh, uh, th that this happened without my knowledge or that i took uh, due diligence but if the company has found a company has been found to be guilty then if i am an officer in charge and it's a fairly wide definition or understanding of who an officer in charge is then again i am sort of on the hook uh i will stop with this and i think that's the end of my slide as well uh happy to take questions anand thanks anil so would you like to begin with the data portability question that was raised in the last you know round where yeah. if you if you make a request can the company still retain the data i think yeah that i think that depends also on the in the portability typically has two aspects right portability and it's a distinct right from the right to erasure so if i want to exercise my right to data portability then i'm telling the company two things one that i want access to my information uh that is part one part two is i want you to transfer this information from service provider a to service provider b in scenario 2 then i will also likely tell the company whether or not i want to continue using your services if i want to continue using your services then i will you know then then i will sort of uh, retain that information with you if i don't want that to happen then i will tell you hey please now delete my data uh, portability like one of these um, like a lot of other things in the pdp bill is also something for which we'll have to wait and we'll have to wait for the delegated legislation to come through to tell us how exactly this is going to play out but broadly there are two aspects some some of us might only want a copy of our information some of us might want um, to be part of both organizations so you know we we'll, we'll have to sort of wait and see how that plays out uh, now just revisiting divid jains It's a larger policy question, right? About small and medium enterprises and balancing yeah. their rights with you know, the data protection law. Your thoughts on that? So honestly, the the principle in the bill is that, or, or the overarching principle, I think, extending to the bill, is that it doesn't matter whether you're big or small, because. Uh, you know person data protection bill in india also is a rights based um, uh, legislation it flows from the fact that all of us have a fundamental right to privacy and the individual is at the center of this information very many companies organizations try to argue that you might want to treat um, you know smaller organizations different from the larger organization so should we be on the hook uh, necessarily in in quite the same way as a small company like some of the larger ones and i don't think that uh, that the indian law has uh, makes room for something like that there is you know there is a i think manual processing by small entities and please correct me anant is uh, is exempt in very very certain uh, limited situations but beyond that there aren't really too many exemptions in fact the law says if you're significant and significance is also a function of the kind of processing activities you will undertake not necessarily only your size and turnover and we'll see a lot of the more um you know innovative processing taking place by the smaller companies and startups and i think the law for the law that means well if you're going to do something that's so untested or if you're going into uncharted territory then you have to meet a higher sort of threshold and um compliance requirement so yeah it is it is something that organizations struggle with for sure but i think the the other side to that story is well companies complied with the gdpr so then they'll find a way to comply with the the person data protection bill as well and it's it's going to be uh, the law going forward in practically every country around the world you can't not be compliant with a pdp bill so yeah uh, rachit srivastava has an interesting question 
broadly the question is is there a connection between the concept of intermediaries under the it act and the concept of intermediaries which of course in the bill now social media intermediaries and so on is there any sort of connection between that safe harbor principle and the personal data protection bill and does it offer any safe harbor so that question is a bit vague but i think broadly is wants to know if there's any connection at all so i think um social interestingly if you look at it on the policy side i i if i remember correctly it was reported that um uh, meti wasn't uh, meti was trying to figure out what to do with the social with with the intermediary guidelines the amendments to the intermediary guidelines given that now you had this definition of social media intermediary and certain heightened obligations on social media intermediaries in the person data protection bill as well is that an overlap well yes because social media companies do qualify as intermediaries under um in under under india's it act and your your intermediaries intermediaries guidelines the question is why is there a provision on social media intermediaries in a personal data protection bill um in the first place and um yes do, do we need to talk about uh do we need to have a larger conversation on on the kind of um content on social media intermediaries and what their obligations should be well yes of course countries in the world are doing it but the pdp bill is really not the right. not the place to be to be doing it yeah so nirmal krishnan has a question on the reverse possibility that there are many organizations processing outsourced data from foreign countries are there any provisions in this bill pertaining to those businesses i'm not sure i understand i uh, know so basically countries that are outsourcing insourcing data basically from foreign countries right and data so if i'm an in, if i'm an indian company and i'm getting data from foreign companies yes is that it yes okay great so then if i'm a data processor then i will what will, what will typically happen is that you every data protection law will spell out will have a clause that says if you are processing data of the people in my country in any way shape and form right now this could be people in my country this could be residents that could this could be citizens then my law will apply to you so a lot of the indian companies that do business with their european counterparts for example or when they are getting data from uh, 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 from companies in europe will have to sign contracts that they are complying with the gdpr it's 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 a clause that you that you that you have to it's a representation that you have to make when you're signing when you're signing that kind of contract if you are in india and you're processing data then the person data protection bill will of course continue to apply to you. Neha, we are hard pressed for time, I know, uh, but there's one last question, and then we can wind up. Uh, sure. So, Pawan Kumar has asked a question on whether this uh, bill, uh, if it becomes law, will cover data breaches committed by governments, both central and state. And uh, he or she has used the example of the Kerala government controversy recently with uh, Sprinkler. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. by definition yes um a, a state is also a data fiduciary uh under the person data protection bill but the challenge will be uh section 35 whether or not or uh, as the government because the government has the powers under section 35 to exempt itself from or uh, the application of any or all of the of the person data protection law now if we, and we don't quite honestly know what that's going to look like it's going to be something that we find out on a case to case basis so if the central government decided to exempt um very many of its agencies from the application of the bill then you know you're not going to have the bill that applies uh to uh, applies to the central government which again of course has been particularly for civil society has been a huge point of uh, criticism and feedback thank you neha this has been a really uh, wonderful and insightful uh, session for all of us uh, and i think with the two master classes we have really covered a lot of ground on data protection for all the students uh, uh, here Uh, we hope uh, to continue engaging with you, and of course with the Kigai Law as we go on building the Daksha Fellowship. And for those of you here uh, present here, we are in the middle of our second round of admissions. Uh, do check out dakshafellowship.org uh, and uh, check out more details about the fellowship. We have 100 percent tuition waivers continuing into our second round, and hope to see some of you as part of the fellowship uh, later this year. and for all uh, the activities that we have done as part of this uh, week 
Uh, we will of course share the presentation with uh, those of you who have requested. And the rest of the videos are available on our YouTube channel, including Neha's lecture soon enough, uh, Daksha Fellowship's uh, YouTube channel. So continue engaging with us and uh, look forward to more such vibrant conversations on technology, law and policy. Thank you, Neha, once again for all the support. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Anand. It, this was a pleasure and all the very best. Thank you. Thank you.